G'day. A little while ago a friend of mine was looking for some help making up some worms for a uh, rotary table and uh, I, I put my hand up to do that and so this particular clip is is I'd have a little bit about why worms are used in rotary tables but also show you the steps that uh, I had to take to, to make these worms. It's a bit like the previous one on the small gears. They're a very small part um, but it does take a lot of time to, to make them. So there's probably somewhere between half an hour and an hour worth of, of effort in each one of these. I, I, was, I, I volunteered to make five of them. So, you know, uh, that also uh, has a, had a few issues. Um, so this is basically the steps I took to make them. Uh, and there'll be another video because I had a few problems along the way showing some of the problems I had and how to uh, perhaps not recover, but but how to avoid those problems uh, or or set up to get around those problems in the future. This is the the rotary table in question. Um, there's the table part. This gear fastens up underneath there, and then in that hole there, there's a basically a screw. I mean that's what a worm is is a screw. Um, that's a that's a large one that I made for uh, a test piece I think quite some time ago but you can imagine that as that that turns it slowly turns the gear and so one turn of that is going to be one tooth of this gear and that makes it really good for high ratio reduction gearboxes gearboxes that go at low speed because you can be driving this and get um, 40 to 1, 80 to 1, 50 to 1, 120 to 1, whatever you like. Right? It's, it's really how many teeth has this gearbox, uh, how many teeth has this worm gear got. You can also have multi-start worms, so instead of having one thread, it's got two. And so you, you, can, you can then say, right, I've got a, say, a 40 tooth gear, I've got a two-start worm, and so that'll actually give me a 20 to 1 reduction. That's another possibility too. To make a worm gear, this is, this is basically just a, um, a helical gear. It's got a slight helix on it. But to make one, and this is a homemade hob, you're basically hobbing them. You're doing that and cutting the teeth. Okay. This is a simple worm drive because it's it's basically straight teeth but on on high power units they've got a curved section they've generally got a, a bevel on them so that only the the bit in contact is is actually doing anything um, this is a lot more simple this is this is purely for for indexing and so uh, a straight straight gear you can get away with you can even use a straight cut spur gear as, as you can probably make out there's a slight angle on there which corresponds to the helix angle of the worm. If you use a straight cut gear, you can do that. It just means that the, the worm has to be inclined, and so that's another possibility too. To start cutting out my worms, I've, I've got a bit of round bar stock, and using the techniques I talked about in the um, stretching of capabilities of bandsaw video, I've cut that into a whole bunch of pieces. So out of that I'll get some, some worms. The rest of this won't go to waste, it'll be used for other, other things. But uh, I do find that, uh, well, I don't keep large amounts of square stock in, in my shed and so therefore I, I do use this te quite, technique quite a bit. This is actually EN25, uh, which is akin to something like 4140, um, which will be fine for these. Usually when, when, when doing worm gears, you, you try and make the worm gear out of something like a phosphor bronze or a cast iron, and you have a hardened part for the, the worm, or a, a harder part for the worm. And uh, that way you, you, the, the wear is in the, the worm gear rather than in the, in the worm. One of the first things I need to do is round up my stock. Uh, it's rather ironic. I seem to spend a lot of my time in the workshop either squaring up round stock or rounding up square stock. You can't win. When setting stuff up in a forge or with, with round stock it's easy because your indicator is, is running on a, on a constant surface. Here you've got flats and you want to try and get the flats right. So one thing that you need to do is 
when you have your indicator there. Rock the work until you get a minimum reading. Okay, that's that's the reading you're you're aiming for. When you rotate the work, you need to either withdraw the carriage that way, or do it this way, right? And then you rock it again, and that tells me there's nine thou difference between this side and this side. So I can now adjust that and get that relatively square. This particular bit of stock has got a curved side on one side, so I, I, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to centre that, so what I may have to do is zero these two sides and then adjust this side so that it is also zero, and work on the basis that this is this piece is basically square and, or squarish, and so I should be all right. I squared my stock up to put a centre in, and that was all fine, and then I moved it out, and the idea was that I was going to be able to uh, turn that round and then I could remount that in the chuck, centre it up, turn the other end. It's not cooperating with me. Uh, the interrupted cut from knocking these corners off is enough that it's shaking this back into the vise. What I've got here is a device I made up and it's, as you can see, it's, it's a bit of five millimetre wire just turned into a, a, a cross shape. That's ground off flat, that sits in there, and then I can push that against that support. And that way, uh, I, can, I can bring my tail stock up and clamp that. I can now center that up and know that even if this does vibrate a bit, it won't send it back into the chuck. And one day I've got to make it one of these for a three jaw because they are handy things to have. Uh, my three jaw's got a, a rather wide bore, and every so often there's something that just doesn't want to stay put. Uh, and uh, so one of those would be handy. This is now clamped. It shouldn't it shouldn't shake, and because it's it's four pieces continuous, uh, it won't come out. So I can leave that there without any any dramas uh, at all. Uh, one day I'll get around to making up some thicker versions of this, not so much for this one, but for the three jaw, so that I can use it as a bit of a, a, a stop as well that way. But anyway, that's a sim simple solution for, for material sliding back. And um, I mean, that could be because this is saw cut, and so it's not, there, there, there could be burrs on it, there could be a slight taper on it, all sorts of things. Uh, end result doesn't matter. Um, we just need to hang on to it. Here's the first piece. Uh, and you can see that I've just got minimum clean up here. I'm almost running into the, the flat there, and the same on the other side. Here I've similar because I, I use that same zero on this side. That side's got a bit more room. I'm letting this cool down a bit. Uh, it's almost cool now, but once I've done this piece, I can then turn these around uh, and turn those into a nice um, round bit of stock that I can then cut up and turn into worms. This is a worm blank. Uh, it's oversized because I'm going to machine it down on a mandrel, but in order to put the keyway in there, I need to make up a, uh, a bush to go in there. So I've got the start of one there. Uh, I've talked about this before, but I thought, well, I'm making one. I might as well run you through it. So that'll go in there. I need to put a slot in for a keyway. Now, the way these things work is you want the end of the, of the brooch to be basically flush or in line with the, the, the circular feature there. So that'll set your depth, okay? And that's going to be hard up against that, so that's, that's fine. But the width is another matter because you need some clearance for that to be able to move. And so one way to do that is with a, a pin gauge, okay? And by some strange fluke, that one goes pretty much straight in, and that's 0.132 of an inch. So... 3.3 three doesn't go in, 3.1 does, and it's, it's, it's rather sloppy, okay? If I measure that, I've got uh, 0.128, so 3.2 gives me a fourth hour clearance, which sounds about right. Uh, that's 0.1 of a millimetre. So 
the next thing to do is, is to mill a slot in that of the, of the depth to suit the brooch um, and of the, of the right width. I'm making up a mantle to turn my uh, worm blanks on. Okay. Just a, a, a trick here that I thought I'd, I'd tell you about. I've used a parking tool to come in and take this down to my, my finished size. There's going to be a thread there, so it doesn't matter too much. But as you can see, the, the, the tool I'm using doesn't fit past the centre. So if I can extend that there, it means that I don't have this problem with the tool striking the centre when I want to use it. You can also get extended centres. This is from a removable set I have, but they're like that. So you can get a bit more clearance that way. But this is probably a quicker and easier way of doing things um, if you're just doing a, a, a one-off like this. What's going to happen here is that um, I'll turn that down to size for, for the, 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 the blank and then I'll put a thread on there and use that to screw things up. Um, and sorry about the rain if it's coming in, but it's raining. I'm just about to start effectively thread cutting. I've had to put a couple of change gears in here. The way this lathe works, and it's probably common with a lot of others, is that the built-in gearbox does the common threads. If you want to do something uh, out of the ordinary, and because um, circular pitch involves pi, it's going to be a strange number anyway, I've got to put a set of gears in there which are going to sh uh, ineffectively trick the lathe make it think that it's got a higher speed coming than it has. I've got the box here set on 9 TPI, but when I come to the thread, and I've just run a, a texture across there, when I've come to the thread, it's actually coming out a bit over 7, uh, which is what I want. Um, so, you know, rather than do a scratch pass, because I always get confused with these gears, I use a texture, put a, put a trace on there, and then I can uh, you know, measure that and say, am I, am I close enough? And if I am, I can then do a scratch pass with some degree of confidence that I've got the gears around the right way. This is an old school um, gear tooth gauge. And the way they work is that if that's on the outside of your tooth, you adjust this to be what the, the amount in the PCD should be and you adjust this to be the width of the tooth um, at the PCD, which you know because it's the circular pitch divided by two, and that should give you, as you can see here I hope, get that closer, that should show you that your, your tooth is to size. You can get these in, in digital forms these days. I don't like the digitals because it's one of those things that you put the batteries in, you use it once every six months or a year, and um, that's about it. Uh, various people make them. Starrett make them. This is a Buck and Hickman. Um, I think I've got a, a, an Etalon somewhere in the place. Uh, one of those bits of kits that you don't see very often. Uh, rare as rocking horse droppings, as someone uh, once said to me. So applying that to the worm over here, um, it's not quite down and using some feeler gauges I've estimated I need to go in about another 20 thou which is roughly what I think I need to go anyway so I'm, I'm quite happy with that um, but from here on it's just a matter of plugging away and when when I uh, when I get close to that 20 thou I'll, I'll try this again as you can see quite a bit of prep to actually get down to cutting the gears or cutting the cutting the threads. Um, anyway, I uh, hope that's been enjoyable, and uh, we'll see you for the next one.